I look forward to sharing my thoughts on how we can help keep our Woodland Park from becoming a land of big government, more red tape for businesses, higher taxes, and less freedoms for our citizens. I look forward to showing how we can preserve Woodland Park's identity, be fiscally responsible, Stop. and retain the freedom to self-govern. Thank that you. Was rude, but just giving you a feel for it. Thank, thank you so you. much. Don. Thank you. I'd like to thank um, the chamber for this opportunity tonight. My name is Don DeZellum, and I've lived here since 1991. And I've either, well, I have either lived here, worked, or had ties to Woodland Park since 91. Um, I've seen the city grow from a small town with dirt roads, one grocery store, and the closest thing to a department store was Ben Franklin when I moved here. Um, over the years, the city has grown in population building and changed tremendously in demographics. And the citizens are divided over the direction our city will take in future over the growth, city services, transportation, heritage preservation, transportation, wildlife, housing, being enterprise friendly, and the role of the city government among other issues. I do not have an agenda going into this election to cut the budget to bare bones, make major changes to planning and zoning codes, get a reliever route for Highway 24. My desire instead is to be a good steward of the city's resources and represent you, the citizen. I will always be willing to meet with citizens and to hear your concerns and input on the issues that matter to you. I will strive to look at all the information presented, ask questions of the city staff and my fellow council persons and resident input when making my decisions on issues. I will work with my fellow council persons in a respectful manner to build consensus, consensus on the issues presented. I have regularly attended city council meetings for over two years and currently serve on the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board for Woodland Park. Thank you. You did good watching, Scott. Thank you very much, Don. Catherine. Hi, I, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm Catherine Nakai, and I too would like to thank the Chamber and Carol Harvey for this evening. I've lived in Colorado for 42 years, and I'm a 19 year resident of Woodland Park. I grew up in the Springs in an Air Force family and met my husband of 30 years there. When it came time to buy our first home, we chose Woodland Park. I'm an integrated circuit layout designer working in the Springs and now from home. Uh, I love the engineering challenges and the creativity of my job. I've been involved with several community groups, contentious topics such as Walmart, the Aquatic Center, tiny homes, cluster developments, natural grocers, and have spent the last year working with the Planning Commission and the Planning Department on Municipal Code Amendments. I'm currently a regular member of the Board of Adjustment for Woodland Park. I'm not a developer, business owner, or a career politician. I have no hidden agendas or ulterior motives other than to serve the citizens of Woodland Park. I love the mountain life. I love Woodland Park. It is truly a great place to live, and I want to serve our city with intelligent growth, preserve our city services, and help keep Woodland Park Woodland Park. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. We're going to start with Stephanie with the first question. And um, as I said before, a lot of these came from issues that, it, that came up before the election in April and others that have been uh, addressed in the, the two local weekly papers. So I don't think there's going to be any surprises here. But uh, again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's just what are your feelings about this particular issue? So my first question, starting with Stephanie, is the proposed Highway 24 reliever route has been a focal point and a possible solution for returning walkability, safety, and enjoyment of our downtown to the community and businesses. Do you support the construction of this project? And if so, would you debt finance the project as soon as possible or wait 15 to 20 years to accumulate enough cash to pay the city's share? And go with Stephanie. Thank you. Well, this is a topic that we have heard about for many years. This isn't the first go round that we've heard about this topic. It was talked about decades ago. Um, 
I absolutely support the idea of the reliever route. Uh, one of the things that I can bring to council is a very long-term vision of what this town looks like because I have every intention of living here the rest of my life. I recognize that the choices we make today will have impacts and opportunities in the future that I will get to recognize. Um, with that, as far as taking on the debt now or later, really we're at the mercy of CDOT. It's going to be up to them to decide when this happens. Um, all we can do is prepare the city to be in the best financial position possible to be able to act on that when CDOT is ready to move forward. And of course, prepare our residents and the businesses for the impacts, but what I ultimately see is a long-term opportunity for a vibrant downtown once that does happen. Thank you. Thank you. John, you want me to repeat it or do you think you got the gist I of think that I got question? The gist. All right. Um, you know, the reliever route's gonna happen eventually. Um, and right now it's probably gonna be 20 years out to begin with before CDOT can come up with um, the funding for their end of it. Um, right now, most of their projects and plans for this area are down in the springs. Um, but I agree with um, Stephanie that the city needs to be in the proper financial position when that opportunity comes to be able to provide our part of the funding for it. Um, so we need to start being good stewards now of what we have and setting aside money for that by uh, eliminating our debt that we currently have. Thank you. And Catherine. It, the, I think this is a very difficult decision to make for anybody up here. Um, I think our job really is to communicate with CDOT to try to currently mitigate um, the traffic we do see in the event that the bypass takes 20 years. Uh, you know, we, with the, the new light timing seems to have made a significant difference yeah, in the last two weekends that I've noticed. So I think there's some positive that's come from that, but I don't really know the answer. I mean, I think we need to creatively come up with a way to solve the financial um, issues and go from there. Thank you. We'll start the next round with uh, John. Don, the Downtown Development Authority, or the DDA, has attempted for many years to promote and develop Woodland Station, which is a prime piece of commercial real estate in the heart of the city's downtown corridor. What's your opinion about how the DDA is managing the development of Woodland Station, and what would you do with Woodland Station? Woodland, uh, <clears throat> or the DDA and Woodland Station there, um, they've had several people that have looked at it, wanted to develop on it. Things have fallen apart for whatever reasons. Um, currently, I believe there's still a person now who's presented a new project for it. Um, if that falls apart, personally, I'd like to see the city take that property back and sell it themselves. Um, it's been eight years or so since the DDA started to try to get rid of that piece of property and it still hasn't happened. Catherine? Um, I, you know, the D, I don't think the DDA has, has done a service to the city over the past 20 years as a whole. I think they've done some great projects. We've got natural grocers. We have uh, the Dinosaur National or the Dinosaur Resource Center, Tractor Supply, but they're not a marketing business. Um, they really should focus on paying down their debt to the bank and cease wasting our money and then try to, I don't know, to be honest, it's a, it's a very difficult decision, but I think we need to maybe look at redoing the board for increasing, increasing, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, that's always dis discerning. It's very distractive. But yeah, it is very distractive <laughs> um, to, to get some more community support on it, and not just people in the district. Stephanie, I saw you taking notes. Thank you. So a few things on that. Uh, first of all, to consider what would we do with the with Woodland Station. Um, 
keep in mind the DDA was created because the government could not incentivize private developers um, through government programs. So in talking about city council, that's one of those things that is kind of out of our control. That's why we have a DDA. Um, and again, taking the land back, it is one of those that if the city owns the land, we can't incentivize someone to buy it or develop it. The DDA has certain tactics at, it, at its disposal to be able to do that. Um, also to your point, Catherine, I know you said we should look at you know replacing some of the board, but we just had three board positions that were up and had no one apply for it, which unfortunately city council so far has failed to go ahead and seat new members. Uh, so it sounds like great ideas, okay. but Thank unfortunately you. there are issues. Thank but, you. Carol, how do we do that? May I rebut? Uh, yes, you may, 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> um, I don't disagree that we haven't been able to replace the candidates, but I think that there aren't enough business owners that are interested in it, and that's where I think we should go outside the district and maybe get regular citizens to support it um, or to at least help and maybe come up with outside the box creativ creativity ideas. Thank you. Mayor? Um, 30 seconds. Um, and that would be fantastic if we could, but unfortunately the makeup of the board of the DDA is set by Colorado state statute. So until that is changed, we are limited to seating members on the board of the DDA that are within the district. I understand that. Okay, thank you, Don. Did you wanna weigh back in again? <laughs> okay. Um, the next question will first go to Catherine, and again, it's one minute. Um, in 2016, by a 60% yes vote, Woodland Park voters approved a 1.09 sales tax uh, to supplement the RE2 school district budget while retiring one of the two school district um, property tax mill levies for the city residents. Are you in favor of ignoring that majority vote to overturn the tax and why? And that is something that the city council can do. Um, no, I would not overturn it. I believe the citizens voted for it and overturning it would go against the will of the people. Thank you. And by the way, you don't have to talk for the entire Minute. 60 seconds, just so you know. Stephanie, the same question. Uh, I agree with you, Catherine. I, the citizens made it very clear that they approve the tax. I don't think it's uh, within the role of government to overturn a vote of the citizens. However, um, I would suggest that maybe looking at a potential sunset date that was left off of the original vote uh, might be in our interest. That seems to be part of the contention is that uh, this tax continues to be paid. Granted, the city agreed to be the pass-through for it, uh, but looking at a sunset or possible renewal where the citizens can reaffirm their support of the tax, uh, being cognizant that there was debt that was taken out in regards to the tax that was collected, uh, but allowing the citizens to review the tax after that debt is paid and ask if they still want to continue to support that or not would be my recommendation uh, regarding that issue as far as whether to continue to uh, allow the, the uh, school to retain the tax or not and look at that as a potential future option. Okay. Thank you. Don. I'm in favor of keeping it. Um, the citizens did vote on it. They wanted it. Um, and by not being a mill levy, against their property taxes, that tax is being paid for by citizens or people that come from out of town. I mean, so you gotta, you're spreading the bases out there. Um, people other than just the citizens of this town are supporting the school district, which is used by people that don't necessarily live in the town. So um, I feel that it's a fair way of doing it. Okay, thank you. All right, now we'll start back with Stephanie. The city's weathered the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and continues to assess the repercussions for the city's government, the businesses, and our individual citizens. What do you believe the city's done well, and what do you think we need to do to prepare for a similar disaster? That is quite the question. Um, I, the first thing I would say, the city has done a fantastic job of communicating information to the citizens. Uh, they've utilized every platform they possibly can um, through social media and the website. 
um, as well as the television channels. Um, so they've really done a good job of disseminating information uh, to the citizens. Um, as far as what they could do better, I really think that's probably a good question to ask the staff as well as the citizens um, because they're going to be the ones that have the answers to maybe what got lost and what got dropped through the cracks and what they'd like to see done differently. Uh, but I really do commend the city and the city staff in particular um, on how they've communicated with the city of Woodland Park and its residents over during COVID. And ongoing. Yeah. <laughs> John? Um, I really feel the city has done a fairly good job of communicating what's going on with COVID. Um, you know, there's been regular updates on their Facebook page, um, next door, um, the website. Um, part of what you have to understand is the city was pretty much secondary to the county on this. And, um, a lot of the determinations on how things were to be conducted came down from the state and the county level. The city just had to implement what they were going to do as far as, um, you know, like access, access to city buildings, that type of stuff. So I think they've done a good job. Thank you. So can you repeat the question? Uh, the, we've weathered the impacts of COVID-19 and um, we're continuing to assess the repercussions for the city's government, businesses, and individual citizens. Uh, what do you believe the city's done well? And what do you think we need to do to prepare for a similar disaster? You know, I think I have to agree with both Stephanie and Dawn. I think we've done the best we could. Um, it's a pandemic. You don't know what the next one's going to do, how it's going to affect us. It could it could be completely different. So I think, I think we just do the best we can with the knowledge that we have and, and go forward. All three of you were here during Heyman and Waldo Canyon. Okay. Thanks. Just wanted to make that point. <laughs> you guys have been there before. Um, mask, can we just go back on? Mask, please. Do you have a mask? She has oh, you have a letter? I haven't seen one of those yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. I didn't, I wasn't looking behind me. I didn't know we had. Okay. So we were starting with Stephanie on that last question on COVID-19. Uh, so we'll go to Don now. Uh, let me see if I can keep from twisting this. Recently, some local business owners and political groups proposed the city reinstate a vendor fee. The issue has been framed by some as a business support initiative. However, if approved, this action will have little impact on small businesses. It's like an estimated amount of $25 to $50 annually and would disproportionately reduce the city's revenues by more than $250,000 in a single year. Additionally, it gives the largest proportion of benefit to the largest corporate businesses like Walmart, City Market, and Safeway. So knowing this, do you support this initiative? No, I don't. Uh, disclaimer, I work for Walmart. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's fair that Walmart get that money back and the local businesses don't. Um, Not in proportion. Right, yeah. in proportion. So... Um, you know, I, I really think that um, the state is going to be doing some of that refunding with, through the state. Um, and I'd rather see them do that than the city do it right now because of that disproportionate amount of money that would go back to the big box stores. Thank you. Catherine? Um, with the research I've done, I would I would say no, um, unless I would hear from a number of small businesses that would say that it would make them profitable and it would keep them whole. Um, if if we did reinstate it, I don't think it should be a fairly large amount, and I think it should be capped, so that the larger businesses don't get the thousands of dollars in in credits. Thank you, Stephanie. I. 
I will point out that both the uh, state of Colorado, Teller County, and our local ambulance uh, ambulance district uh, all provide a sales tax vendor credit back to businesses for the tax that they collect on their behalf. Uh, the city is the only taxing entity that ha that does not do that. Um, Carol, you mentioned $250,000 impact to the city. Um, when you instate a cap, which I do, I do support a cap on the largest uh, retailers, the impact is closer to $180,000 to the city. Um, it, it is incumbent upon us to recognize that without the businesses collecting sales tax revenue on behalf of the city, that sales tax revenue makes up the majority of the funds that the city operates on. In an $11 million budget, six and a half million dollars of that is sales tax that the businesses collect. Without that, the city would be in dire straits and every other taxing entity recognizes that and Thank gives you. them credit. Thank you. And thanks for that number. Mine was an approximation. Thank you. Um, we've gone all the way around on this one. All right, now Catherine. Um, a previous city council member advocated for significantly reducing road and stormwater maintenance in our city by diverting the 410 and the 420 enterprise accounts to build a second phase of the Woodland Aquatic Center. At least one of you on the panel has indicated in a public forum that you supported the fund diversion. I'd like to ask each of you now if you still would support such a measure. I was, pro I was not the one that said I would support it because I, I basically read the article in the paper, but I, I wouldn't, without more information, support it. I would need to do research before I would agree to it. Okay, Stephanie. Uh, in regards to diverting the 410 fund, there are certain expenses that are currently paid out of the general fund um, that would qualify to be paid out of the 410 fund. Now, however, to do that in order to fund a second phase of the aquatic center might be premature. Uh, we first need to look at and address the expenses for the aquatic center and get it up to optimal efficiency um, before we look at putting more money into a second phase. Perhaps maybe we can do that at some point, um, but we really need to address the uh, low return um, that we're getting from the aquatic center now uh, before directing more funds to it. Thank you. Don. I'm not in favor of diverting the funds. Um, right now, the, we still have a large debt on the current aquatic center that needs to be paid off. Um, Diverting money from those two funds isn't going to be enough alone just to pay off or to pay for a second phase um, on the aquatics aquatic center. Um, eventually, after the debt is currently paid off on the aquatic center, adding that second phase will help the prof profitability of that center. But for the time being, no. Um, let me. Again, I'll start with Catherine coming around. Would any of you be in favor of diverting the, the street fund is with the, you know, the 410 and the 420 for any uh, reason? Catherine? I, I, you know, I honestly wouldn't say yes without knowing what the reason is. Okay. I agree with Catherine. I think that's kind of a broad question. I mean, it, you know, there could be a, we could have another pandemic and, it, you know, the city's completely shut down or, uh, complete disaster. Um, but again, the 410 fund is somewhat restricted. So even the idea of diverting the funds uh, is limited because by statute, those funds are limited as far as what they can be spent on. Don? I agree with my uh, worthy opponents here. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, next one, we'll start with Stephanie. The city adopted a strategic plan in 2019 that identifies a vision and a mission for the community and related goals and objectives to achieve both. Countless hours were dedicated to the effort with input provided by the council, the staff, citizens, local business, and local business owners. Um, it was about a three and a half month effort. Ultimately, all agreed the most critical goal for the city is the provision of safety and security for all who work and live here. Considering the importance of safety and security for all of us, with special emphasis on our police department, 
and those that maintain our water supply and streets, are you willing to sacrifice in other areas to fairly compensate our city employees? When, when you talk about sacrifice, I don't think you need to sacrifice. Um, of course, public health and safety should be the top priority of all of our elected officials. Uh, that is the most basic service that government is to provide to the citizens. Uh, we should not have to and don't need to sacrifice um, paying our, our, our city employees what they're worth um, in order to sacrifice public health and safety. There are plenty of ways to save on expenses. Um, that's one of the things that I have a lot of experience with is expense, expense management. Uh, to be able to look at ways to most efficiently spend taxpayer money in which case that doesn't actually mean reducing services. That means being able to provide the highest level of service possible because we're not spending money on things that aren't necessary. I'll come back on that one for all three of you, but Don? I believe that we need to be good stewards of what we have as far as finances for the city so we can afford to pay the um, essential employees what they're worth. Um, and beyond that, we need to find ways to um, give them other benefits, you might say, that don't cost a whole lot. Um, just little perks that can be given that don't cost much, but would mean a lot to them to make them feel like they're appreciated by the city. And Catherine? I'm going to make you read the question again. I'm sorry. Um, we adopted, the city adopted a strategic plan in 2019 that identifies a mission and a vision and the goals and objectives to uh, achieve that. Um, there was certainly uh, an effort to emphasize safety and security as part of that overall strategic plan. Um, so if that in fact is the most critical goal for the city, the provision of safety and security for all who live and work here, uh, and considering the importance of safety and security with special emphasis on our police department and those that maintain our clean water supply and our, uh, our streets, are you willing to sacrifice in other areas to fairly compensate our city employees in those positions? That's a tough question. Um, I would say we would need, to, I, I would say yes in the broad strokes, but I would think that we would need to go to all the departments and figure out the best, least impact um, to all citizen or to all city services, um, critical, non-critical, and decide what is best at that time to, um, to do that. I'm going to come back around and, and um, talk about when one, one of you will be elected and you're going to be right there at the very tail end of the uh, budget approval for 2021 for the city. Uh, right now, the uh, council and the city manager are considering a flat budget. Uh, that means no raises for anybody. Um, so uh, rephrasing my question, would you be willing to um, renegotiate that flat budget and look at uh, salary increases for some of our uh, essential uh, safety and security employees? Stephanie. Uh, I think as far as renegotiating the budget with a seventh council member, I'm glad to see that the current council um, has put as much time and effort into getting the budget as far as they could have thus far. Um, but I think we're all aware of the situation the current council finds it, it, itself in as well. Um, and it's gonna be imperative that whichever one of us is elected as that seventh council member, um, that budget as much work ha as has been done um, renegotiating things in it, I, I just can't help but imagine that that is going to be a part of, the, of upcoming council meetings. Um, having sat through so many of them, Carol, you know quite well, um, those things can constantly change and situations can change as well. Uh, but I expect not necessarily the flat budget idea to change, but there can be a number of things that, that change after that seventh council member is seated. Don. I agree with what Stephanie said. Um, the main thing is going to be the time frame between the time one of us takes that position and the time that the budget has to be approved and passed. Um, there may be not may not be a lot of time to renegotiate into that budget. Um, 
So yes, there would probably be some things if I got seated that I'd want to put some input into and see if it could be changed if I didn't agree with it. Realistically, I don't know if it'd be possible due to the time constraints. Thank you, Catherine. I'd actually have to agree with both Don and Stephanie. Thank you. Yes, 30 seconds. Hold on, don't count me yet. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get the mic to work. Now. Um, I would just mention as well, yes, we do have a time uh, deadline for when the budget has to be passed. Um, however, if the budget is not passed by that deadline, then it does default to an O&M budget. Um, so if there really are things that council still needs additional time to work out because of the late arrival of a seventh council member, there are, uh, there are provisions in place to be able to allow a full council to do that even after the budget deadline has passed. No, I've got one back up. Okay, all right. I have uh, one uh, one more question for each of you, and I think we're going to start with Dawn this time, um, and then one one that I want all of you to answer, and then one for each of you. So this next one comes up all the time, and sometimes we forget about it. But in 2013, Woodland Park City Council voted three to two to prohibit recreational marijuana sales in the city limits. The resulting ordinance also prohibits the operation of medical marijuana centers, commercial cultivation operations, and the sale of medical marijuana infused products. Do you believe the city council should revisit this issue? And if so, how would you vote? Don. I'm always open for a revisit. Um, personally, I would vote no. Um, but you know, times have changed since 2013. Um, maybe it'd be a situation where we reword what we wanted to do. Uh, recreational, no. Medical, yes. Mm -hmm. Catherine? I would say no. Okay. And Stephanie? Uh, I, along the same lines as what Dawn said, um, I'm not typically one to inhibit or regulate business. Um, however, in this case, I, I guess my first question would be, what is the interest? Um, do any of the prospective business owners who might consider opening a business like that, uh, is Woodland Park an area that, that would be prosperous for them to do so? Um, so if not, it might be putting the cart before the horse um, to ask if we should or shouldn't revisit that issue uh, before knowing whether or not that might be something someone might want to bring to our town to begin with. Um, I, I would hate to regulate out a business um, regardless of what it is. Um, it, commerce is going to drive things. Uh, if there's no appetite for that sort of business, then it's not really an issue for city council that it would need to take up to begin with. Thank you. Okay, the next um, three questions that I have were um, uh, based on I've reviewed your Facebook pages, I've reviewed newspaper articles, so it's one for each of you. And I'm, I'm gonna start with Catherine, and then we'll come back around the circle. Um, funding to update the city's comprehensive plan was approved in 2019. However, the sitting council has decided that this expense and the plan update would be tabled indefinitely. In fact, one council member thought the comp plan should or could be un unconstitutional. Do you think the plan up sh update should commence immediately? Why or why not? Yes, I think we should update the comp plan immediately. I don't know, but certainly for 2021, I think it's a great tool to use for the uh, planning department and the planning commission and the city council to figure out the wants and needs of the citizens of Woodland Park, how we want to develop Woodland Park going forward. Um, and uh, it gets the citizens involved in what they wanna see going forward, like I said, so yes. I'm gonna add, uh, this question came from Zoom that's about the comp plan and I'm gonna add to that. Um, part of the contract uh, for the update of the comp plan included a complete review of all city code. Uh, how do you think we should approach our municipal code? Um, and should updates and potential zoning uh, changes be considered as part of that? 
I think we should do similar to the comp plan and try to get as many citizens involved and businesses as well to see how we can improve the code to make developing a little easier maybe, but also at the same time, still protect neighborhoods, businesses and property rights. And I'm gonna, um, since this question did come from Zoom and it asked that all of the, uh, see I thought I had the original <laughs> thought, but uh, this Zoom question wants all of you to answer that same question. Again, it's uh, budget approved in 2019 to pay for the comp plan with a match from the Department of Local Affairs but it has been tabled indefinitely by the city council. How, how do you feel about that comp plan and should we go ahead with it? I, I agree with where the city council is at for now. They had good reasons uh, to go ahead and put it off, um, including with COVID. Uh, it's relatively difficult to include citizens um, in a community engagement session during COVID, um, as well as with the comp plan. Uh, I, I see the value in comprehensive plans for cities, especially when it comes to managing our resources um, and our infrastructure, maintaining, uh, repairing and improving roads and water and wastewater services. Uh, the, the concern I have with comp plans is that we do them every 10 years um, and sometimes they become extremely outdated uh, long before they're, they're due to be redone. Uh, I think about our comp plan from 2010, uh, could not have imagined uh, Karis at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. It was maybe being talked about, but as a real concrete uh, part of our city, that was not something our comprehensive plan in 2010 could have incorporated. John. I believe that we should table the comp plan at least until next year. Um, I'm totally for doing the comp plan. It's just maybe right now isn't the right timing for it due to the COVID. Um, but I feel it's an important part of letting the citizens have a voice in what their community is gonna look like in the future. Just like Stephanie has a vision of what she would like to see the city look like so she can retire here and such. Um, there's a lot of citizens that are the same way. I don't plan on going anywhere else. And I would like to have a say into what my vision of what the city looks like, you know, taking back our downtown as a walking thing. Um, you know, growth being smart, putting the right development in the right place. So I, I think the comp plan is important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, Stephanie, this next question is for you. Uh, and I didn't know if anyone wanted to add to that in a 30 second response. Okay, we're good on that one, great. Um, again, Stephanie, I understand I, I took most of my questions from open source materials. In May of this year, the Woodland Park Main Street Board voted unanimously to remove or accept the resignation of three Main Street Board members to include yourself. The basis for the action was uh, ethical misconduct. Actually, in my review, it was not as much as ethical misconduct, but possibly a violation of the state open records and op open meeting law. Do you feel this is important? Do you feel it's important that our country, or excuse me, our community elect a city council member who is ethical and follows the rule of the law? Um, do you want to comment on that, please? Oh, of course. I'm not sure what you're referring to as far as open records law. The meeting in question was open to the public with a Zoom link, uh, regardless. The whole topic that that was surrounded by, um, I stand by 100%. I don't just sit here and say I support businesses. I do it. Um, it as far as the way that has been twisted through the Woodland Park rumor mill, I invite anyone to reach out to me. I am happy to send you all of the recordings for those meetings. Um, I have nothing to hide. Uh, I welcome you to review them. I conducted myself in a professional and appropriate manner, and I will always stand up and support businesses and business-friendly pra practices. Um, unfortunately, uh, that was not welcome, and that was the result. Uh, what I do have from viewing the video um, and reviewing the recordings, um, when the specific issue was brought up to a vote, uh, the board chair advised that it was against the bylaws, but you persisted in asking for a vote to be taken on an issue that was not on the agenda. And that is what is in fact a violation of the open meeting laws. 
Yes, uh, I am. <laughs> of course, I was part of that conversation. I'm aware of it. Um, I, we had an agenda set at the previous meeting. Um, that, that did not include that issue. Uh, yes, it did. I, again, I'm happy to provide the recordings to anyone who would like to review this themselves um, and not through the lens of uh, the, the twisted facts that tend to get around town. Um, with that as well, uh, the board chair herself called for a vote three times on this issue. Um, again, that's all something that I'm happy for anyone to review uh, enthusiastically, in fact, because uh, I absolutely stand by what I supported and my actions during a very contentious situation. And uh, I have absolutely nothing to hide. Any comments from either other candidate? Don, question for you. Recently, one of the sitting council members uh, commented that city zoning was unnecessary. What do you think about the city's current zoning code and what, if any changes, would you recommend? I feel that right now the city zoning code is probably something that we should look at again, um, go through it, make sure that it's current, up to date, uh, meets the needs of the city, and follows um, any legal things that need to be done with it. Um, look for things that would avoid potential conflicts like we've had in the last year that have caused issues in the city. Um, the, the zoning laws are there for a reason. Um, I'd hate to see a farm put in the middle of my neighborhood or see a um, a bar go up next to a church. So th th there's, there's reasons for zoning um, to keep things in the proper places. Um, so I feel that we should take a look at them and revisit them every once in a while, just like the charter. Yes. And that would be part of the comp plan review if, yes. if the, the existing uh, proposal is uh, actually acted upon. Any of you want to talk about zoning? Yeah, zoning is pretty much near and dear to my heart. And I think we have a great comp plan and a master plan that if we continue to update it, will will keep us where I think we should stay. Um, I would actually like to modify some of the zoning and maybe add another mixed use zone where we could build a, a development with a business on the bottom and an apartment on top. I think that would benefit us immensely. I also think that we need to be very careful in how we finish up building our city. We have very few large lots left for multifamily development. And I think we need to improve our multifamily development to bring more affordable housing and, and uh, more younger people to the, to the town. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, for good or bad. <laughs> Stephanie, did you have anything to add to that? Yes, I just wanted to add uh, in regards to our zoning, um, I find it is important once we set that zoning to stick to it. Um, sometimes that seems to be the reason that we have contentious zoning is issues come to council. We've heard both sides of it, uh, that if you want to control what's done with a property next to you, you should buy it yourself, as well as uh, on the uh, purchaser side of things that uh, sometimes it, it, in the past, city council has been too qu quick to grant zoning changes. Um, so it's also contingent upon the purchaser to be aware of how the land is zoned and whether or not they can do with it as they please. Thank you so much. We're going to now uh, allow our representatives from the press to ask questions. I think Miss Hill, Pat Hill, is our only candidate here tonight from the press. Oh, we have one online too. Okay, but I'm going to let Pat go first. <laughs> Stephanie, this is for you. In June, you were one of three members of the River Park Main Street City Most Reorganization due to an ethics complaint. Uh, and in the courier, we asked if you would address this and we gave you extra time. I wondered if you could address that. Uh, I, I believe I already, I think Carol uh, had already asked that question. Of course, I expected this to continue to come up. Um, so I believe Carol pretty much already covered that question. But she didn't ask about the courier asking the question for last week. 
Perhaps you can be more specific how your question is different from hers. I asked you, why did you not reply to the courier question of the ethics question? Oh, actually, so as you know, uh, I think I had tried to clarify the question on Wednesday when you had asked me about uh, lack of, of proper notice, 48 hours notice for an upcoming DDA meeting, uh, which I had explained to you I was not on the DDA board. I had never served, nor was it my responsibility or authority to notice a DDA meeting. Um, and I had tried to get clarification on that question and your response to me was, okay, if that's your response, go ahead and send it back to me. Do I get another question? Or? Yes, please. Okay. Um, before you do, can you talk into the mic? They're oh, telling yeah. us. Pull your mic over. Pull your oh, mic over oh, to oh, you. Sorry. They're telling us they I can't forgot. hear sorry, you on sorry. Zoom. Stephanie, do you believe along with some of the council that taxes are theft? And that uh, do you plan to cut city services and advocate for cutting city taxes? There's yes and no's to all of those questions. <laughs> um, taxes, it is incumbent upon all of our elected officials who spend taxpayer money to recognize that every dollar they take out of the private sector is a dollar that's not producing. Um, governments do not produce revenue, they only spend it. Uh, so being prudent and fiduciary with those funds is absolutely necessary. However, when it comes to believing that we should cut services, uh, I believe that through prudent expense management, there would not be a need to cut services and provide a high level of service by cutting unnecessary expenses. Thank you. Okay, we can let Bob speak if you want. Oh, please. Okay. Bob Volpe from Mountain Jackpot. So, Rob, can you allow Bob? Do you have me there? We do. We do. Bob, you have your question here, but if you'd like to ask that and then any other question. Okay, sure. Uh, traditionally, City Council in Woodland Park has been a nonpartisan body. Lately, some on council have used their position to interject their political and religious ideologies in off-topic discussions. Will you promise not to speak off-topic and espouse partisan or religious rhetoric during meetings if elected? Bob, is that question for each of the candidates? Yes, that's for each of the candidates. All right, we're gonna start with um, Stephanie. Wow, I'm in the hot seat right now, one after another. <laughs> Um, it, city Council is not nonpartisan. Um, I think to uh, ask whether or not we would stay on topic um, is a relatively uh, high request to make of Council. We see it tangent quite often and sometimes that can lead uh, to better solutions and ideas. Uh, I will always uh, allow my, my principles and my values um, to guide the decisions I make. Um, now, to use this as a platform uh, to be able to spread my own beliefs uh, when it comes to being able to justify decisions I've made and how I've been guided in those decisions, that's one thing. Um, but otherwise, as an elected official, um, to use the dais in a official capacity uh, to to communicate on things like that, we need to be careful of that. Thank you. Don? I too would use my personal conscience and principles in making a decision. Um, but I too look at the slippery slope of using the uh, dais as a soapbox to get up and express my uh, views. So if I, like Stephanie, I may use some of them to explain a decision I've made, but I'm not gonna use it to sit and uh, make it a soapbox. Thank you. Catherine. Section 2.1, Article 2 of our city charter states that all elections should be nonpartisan. Partisan politics tends to divide public servants, especially these days. I prefer to keep this out of our city business and focus on serving the people of Woodland Park, period. 
Thank you, Catherine. Bob, any other questions? Uh, yes, just one short question. Um, do This is for everybody up there. Uh, do you believe in the separation of church and state? Let's start with Catherine on this one. Yes, I do. Thank you. I believe that uh, there's a proper spot, Congress and such open every day with prayer. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to the council opening in prayer, but I would leave that to the decision of the council. And Stephanie? Uh, like Don said, I'm not opposed to the idea of opening with prayer. I thought it was an interesting suggestion when it was made. Um, I, I think it's important to make the distinction as well that when we talk about separation of church and state, um, the Constitution does not dictate that. The Constitution dictates that the government shall make no official religion. Uh, it does not say that government must be separate from religion. It says that government cannot exclude religion. And I feel it's very important for our elected officials, um, as well as with their principles and values, to let their religious beliefs um, guide them and keep them centered in, in doing what's best uh, within, their, within the framework of the office that they serve. So again, that's an important distinction to make that it is not about separating and leaving religion out of government. It is about allowing for all forms of religion within government. Thank you. And just for the record, every council meeting I ever attended, I prayed before, during, and after. <laughs> <laughs> just letting you know. Um, we have a, uh, Bob, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, we've got now some Zoom questions, and I don't know if we're going to have. Do we have any questions from the audience? No, write it down and give it to um, John. Um, here's a first one, I think, and um, this is a an interesting one that I was uh, kind of struggling with when I left council. And I'm gonna start with Don on this one. Do you have an opinion for how to regulate vacation rentals by owner or Airbnb properties in Woodland Park? Uh, I'm, I'm quite aware that there are several within the city limits and that all, not all of them are reporting their sales tax collection or any tax collection. So Don, I'll pass that to you first. They basically that's part of the reason for a business license is to know who your businesses are in a town. Um, so I believe that there needs to be some sort of form of enrollment with the city, you might say. Um, I don't necessarily support a business license fee, um, but I do believe that the businesses should be required to register with the city so we know who they are and can collect the tax from them. Catherine? I would more or less agree with Dawn. Um, I do believe we need to, to, re to I don't wanna say regulate, but we do need to try to find a, a way to, um, to recoup our lodging taxes because we're not getting those with them not being a registered business. And that's significant. That hurts our other lodging um, entities. Stephanie? I, I'm typically not going to be in favor of further regulation of any business, especially when it comes to actually regulating what you might consider business on residential property. Um, I can understand that some would like to see us be able to accurately collect lodging tax on those Airbnbs. Uh, however, I think the more important task is to address how the current lodging tax is being spent, make sure it's being spent within the ordinance that established it. And once we have that under control, uh, then we can go back and look at how and if it is or not appropriate to regulate vacation rentals. And we're going to start with Catherine on this one. Um, hold one. We have someone asking on Zoom, and I just want to 
reiterate, and I think they joined after we started, but the question is, um, are the candidates, do they have their phones on and are they receiving answers? And so um, I- They better not be. <laughs> so I just wanna be able to tell this well, Zoom or they can, they can answer. <laughs> Uh, but we did ask each candidate to turn their phone off. So um, well, that Zoom attendee now knows that. Don't let me get Beth Dutton on you here. <laughs> uh, this question is from the audience. At the city council forum in the spring, the question was asked, and I believe who was a Christian on a, wait a minute. I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to ask this question. We don't need to know what people's religious affiliations are. That, all right. So this one is less about church and state and more about affordable housing. Catherine, what's your take on affordable housing needs in Woodland Park? And how, if any, uh, do you think that the city council uh, or the city government should address this? It's a very difficult topic. Um, previous city councils have gone through this. Planning Commission has gone through it. Um, it's very difficult for developers to build affordable housing, I think, up here. The funding is difficult. There are so many regulations that don't necessarily cooperate with our municipal code. So we would have to work together collectively to find the best solution for that. Um, that said, I think if we can build um, some more apartments and get the multiple family or the multi-family uh, zones built. I think that would help with some affordable housing. Don? There is definitely a need up here for affordable housing. Um, and I agree with Catherine about the fact of we need more multi-family dwellings, apartments, that type of thing. Um, what I don't want to see is like the uh, Trail Ridge project that went in and you're paying $1,300 a month for an apartment. That's not affordable. Affordable would be $700, $800 a month. Something that a teacher up here or a police officer and their family could afford. And I don't believe it's the role of the city um, council to, or the city to lay the road for that to happen. That's private sector. Thank you. Stephanie? It is important for our local city government to be cognizant of the diverse housing needs that we have. Uh, however, the best way for them to serve those is to be aware of them and to be able to set up an environment in which all the different types of housing that need to be provided can be provided by the private sector and developers, that it's not within the city's purview uh, to incentivize, again, going back to why we have the DDA, uh, certain developments of certain characteristics. Uh, what they can be doing is be aware of what the needs are of the citizens and make sure that we're creating an environment here within the city to provide those diverse housing needs and make it attractive for the private sector to be able to provide those. Thank you. And this question is from Zoom. All right, and this is for all three, and we'll start with Don. See if I can read uh, Deb's hieroglyphics here. With the current social unrest that's happening all over the country, but this one specifically calls out, calls out the major cities of Colorado, and I guess the major cities of Colorado are Denver and Denver, but. Um, in reference to Black Lives Matter, Antifa, Proud Boys, et cetera, how will you as a city council member either choose to support or con would you as a city council member uh, choose to support or condemn these political ideologies? Personally, I think that right now that I could not support any of it. Um, if they want to come up and do something peaceful, that's fine. The second that they go one line over the, the letter of the law, it needs to be taken care of. But personally, um, I couldn't support any of them. Thank you. 
Stephanie. I have to agree with what Don said. We typically tend to agree on most things. Um, it, it is one thing for citizens to express their concerns. Uh, that is uh, one of our biggest jobs up here as, as whoever is elected as city council uh, is to hear out the citizens, their concerns and uh, their opinions. Uh, however, there is a way in which to do it. And when it comes to damaging personal property, when it comes to uh, threatening personal lives, uh, when it comes to ransacking uh, cities and towns, that definitely crosses the line. There is a way to have conversations about contentious issues uh, that you can walk away from with solutions. And all this is leaving us with is destruction. Thank you. Kathleen. I don't personally believe in any of the current, the, the ones listed on that um, question, but mm -hmm. I believe everybody has the right to, to protest peacefully and, and they can do so up here if they, if they choose. But I agree with the other two candidates that as soon as it becomes violent or vandalism, it has no place here or in Colorado or anywhere in the country as far as I'm concerned. Far left or far right. Or, yes. Thank you. Any other questions from Zoom? We have one more question, and Stephanie, you're on the hot seat again. It goes back to um, when we talked about uh, diverting 410 and 420 funds for a possible addition to uh, the aquatic center. Um, and it, you made a statement about the low ret return of the aquatic center, and this questioner asked if you could explain that. Yes. So right now the i believe the most recent numbers we have is the return on investment for the aquatic center is it's a little off this year because we don't have consistent numbers because of covid i want to say it's somewhere in the 50 percent range uh, now keep in mind municipal pools are never expected to operate in the black it's just not feasible um, however when you look at the fact that just this year we are spending 330 thousand um, dollars to subsidize the pool versus the hundred thousand dollars that we were expecting when it was built uh, I do believe that there are some efficiencies that we can improve on uh, it sounds like based on everything we've heard from the aquatic center staff they are working extremely hard uh, to increase that return on investment as well um, I think there are opportunities to look at uh, peak operating hours, peak operating days, which might help us also address uh, how to manage the expenses at the aquatic center and limit that subsidy from the city. <laughs> thank you. I know we put you on the spot with that question, and then we cut you off, but thank you very much for the response. Uh, any other questions from Zoom? Uh, I'm not going to take that one. Um, that's what I get to do because I'm sitting here. Um, I, I want to allow you now all to uh, go ahead and provide your closing statements unless we have any more questions from the press or any more written questions from our audience. Mm -hmm. Two minutes each, yes. Okay. We're, we're going to go in the same order that we started. So, Stephanie, if you could please now provide your closing statements. Thank you. I started out this evening by telling you about the tale of two cities. One where we have a beautiful mountain town that allows us to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness every day. The other where we struggle under an ever-growing government whose answer to everything is tax, spend, and create more government programs. In the middle of all of this, we have you, the citizens of Woodland Park, white collar, blue collar, students, family, those who protect and serve, young and seasoned professionals, small business owners, those preparing for retirement, and our senior community that I look forward to being a part of one day. Every one of you has a voice and is vital to this community. You're the ones who have the awesome responsibility to choose the direction that Woodland Park will go in. The Woodland Park I envision is where businesses thrive, families plan for the future, and seniors enjoy the next chapter of their lives without struggling to have their needs met. Where Woodland Park is no longer burdened with excessive debt obligations and we no longer have to make the difficult decisions of choosing which needs to fund now and which to put off until later. Where citizens stay engaged in oversight of local government and feel as though they get, to say, they get a say in what happens. 
and where we reap the benefits of tourism while staying true to the values and traditions that have given us our unique identity. I love this town and especially the people who make it such a wonderful place to live. Vote for me because I love this Woodland Park. I am fighting to make sure that our way of life, those things which we hold sacred, are not swallowed up in the name of progress. I am Stephanie Alfieri, and I am asking you to partner with me on November 3rd and help me preserve Woodland Park, the Woodland Park that we love. Thank you. Thank you. John. Basically, I'm just an average citizen of the city with ties to it for almost 20 years. I work a retail manage, I've worked retail management jobs most of my life and currently work in a retail business up here. Um, I have no agendas tied to any specific groups. Um, basically what I wanna see is Woodland Park move into the future, economically sound, resource sufficient, well with a well-trained and staffed emergency services, properly maintained infrastructure, a thriving business economy, and a place where all demographics would like to reside. Um, if that's your desire too, I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you, Don. Catherine. I would like to thank everyone here for attending the forum and for, par par bleh, for participating on Zoom. It is nothing, if nothing else, I hope this may inspire some of you to run for a public office or volunteer for one of many of the committees or boards that we have availability on. Over 20 years in an engineering environment has taught me to be detail oriented and look for effective solutions to every problem without emotion or bias. I, I am not a tax and spend person. I believe we need to be fiscally responsible with our tax dollars and yet um, work to preserve our critical services. I want you to know if elected, I will take this job seriously. I will, never jo nev uh, I will never join a block vote and promise to make my own informed decisions, which will benefit all of Woodland Park. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And again, thank all three of you. And I wanna reiterate, this, this panel has nearly 70 years of living, loving, learning in, in Woodland Park. And I don't think we could get a better uh, slate of candidates for, for this particular and unusual a vacancy on the city council. Thank you so much for your uh, your participation tonight. You you were great. Didn't have any Chris Wallace issues. Very respectful of our timekeeper, um, and I really do appreciate appreciate it. So that does conclude our 2020 City of Woodland Park Candidates Forum, which was sponsored by the Greater Woodland Park Chamber of Commerce. And again, thank you all. Drive thank you. safely. Thanks. And you get home in time to see the next uh, yes, debate. <laughs>